You're listening to Art Affairs, episode 34. Today I'll be talking to Johnny Command Z Rodriguez. So my name's Michael Faith, and this is Art Affairs. Art Affairs is my attempt at shining a spotlight on the many wonderful people that make up this amazing art community, featuring conversations with artists, gallerists, curators, telling their stories. You can dig through previous episodes, complete with show notes at artaffairspodcast.com, but the best way to stay plugged in is to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. You can also connect with the show on Instagram and Facebook at Art Affairs Podcast. All right, so today's guest is Johnny Rodriguez, also known as Command Z. Johnny was one of the (laughs) living artists that Greg Crayola Simpkins mentioned that he'd like to see me have on the show, and also referred to him a few times during our conversation. Johnny Command Z has had a pretty fascinating artistic trajectory that's crossed paths with some of the biggest media companies, movie studios, and of course my favorite, Nine Inch Nails. We talk about his incredible and super unique career in corporate design and advertising, how he transitioned to start working on his own personal artwork, his upcoming solo show at KP Projects, and a whole lot more. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Command Z. Johnny, welcome to the show, man. I'm really stoked to have you on. Thank you for having me. All right. And I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated by your career in general, so I'm excited to really dive into that. Um, but I first want to kind of talk about how you came up. Um, and from what I understand, you, you were born uh, and grew up in the L.A. area, uh, I believe specifically Baldwin Park. Um, and both of your parents are originally from Nicaragua. Uh, what kind of work did they do? Like, uh, what kind of work did your parents do when you were growing up? My dad, I know my dad to be... Um, he worked blue collar jobs, lifting things with his, throwing out his back, and then finally just uh, going back to school and being a perpetual student and earning maybe, we think we counted up to like maybe five degrees. Oh, wow. In different various fields. And I think he just decided that he never wanted to work and just, um, just again, be a perpetual student and just learn. So that was, seems to be, I think that was his career is just learning. That's, that's a cool, that's a cool way to make a career. I mean, if you can do it, you know, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, but I do understand that like when you were young, um, he did end up going back to Nicaragua to fight in a war. So, um, you know, what was your dad doing in the war? Tell me a little bit about that. So it was really difficult getting information out of him. It was always like, so I read about this. Were you involved in this? And he just, he didn't want to stoke any flames within me and he saw that I was extremely interested and so he really kept it close to the vest. But this was during the 80s. There was the Iran-Contra scandal going on. Um, Oliver North, Nicaragua, bombs or weapons being sold and whatnot. And so he, in the 80s, early 80s, you know, I, I remember he made a tape for us on the front of the tape. He wrote some kids and he basically gave us like a farewell, gave us life instructions mm-hmm. and then went out there to go fight him and his brothers and my uncles. A lot of them had started off working for the government, working as, you know, sheriffs and deputies and then for the military. And then they all turned and became guerrilla fighters fighting to help save their country. He did make it back, but he came, but he didn't make it back because he came back a different person. He just wasn't there anymore. He checked out mentally. Leaving the tape like he did. I mean, that that's the actions of somebody that doesn't expect to come back. Did, did you think that that was what was going through his head at the point where he left? For sure. Yeah. 
And again, in a lot of ways, he didn't come back because he was just a different person. The dynamic of the family and he ended up divorcing my mom. We went from like constantly camping to him locking himself in a room and just trying to learn. Mm. How old were you at, at that point? I was pretty young. I was, I think I was maybe five around there. Yeah. Yeah, that, that must have had a big impact on you, just, you know, that whole experience. And it kind of affected the way that you looked at not only your parents, but just war and just that, that whole relationship in general. Um, for sure. However, I was really young. And so you, at that age, you really don't understand much of what's going on. It was more my, old, my oldest sister who was able to process more information that really took the brunt of and my older brother and my older sister. But for me, I was just like, oh, my dad's not here right now. What do I know? Actually, a funny story. You know, they started sleeping in different rooms at one point, And he took over my bed. And I, I was sleeping with my mom. And then one day, <laughs> I remember telling my dad, I go, so like, I kind of want my bed back. <laughs> and then he, he moved out of the house. Oh. So man. me being the naive kid, I was like. It's my fault. I just kicked my dad out of the house. Like, we're not a family anymore because I moved oh. him out of the house. Not until I was older that I really understand things, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and it probably, I think it was around that age where you actually started getting interested in drawing, right? You you started drawing pretty young. Do you remember like what sparked that initial creativity in you? I have no idea. I just know that um, my memory goes as far back as maybe two years old. I remember things pretty early on. And from that, at that age, I just remember it was just a thing that I had always done. I just remember drawing. And one of my fondest memories that I always talk about is um, I was a latchkey kid and I would, my spot to draw was because I was a latchkey kid, it was the front door had to be open and I hung out and just in the front door well, because you kind of didn't want to like spend time inside the deep cavernous house that was empty. <laughs> I remember just sitting on the floor, always drawing. And one day my dad coming home and mind you, I'm like, six or something and he goes you know what you're drawing it's not that you're creating with that pencil that it's drawing something on the paper it's more of an eraser or that you're simply revealing what's always been there and then just walked away I was <laughs> like what the hell does that mean <laughs> Yeah, that's deep. Um, yeah. I mean, were your parents generally <laughs> supportive of your interest in the arts? Did they encourage that sort of thing in you? My mom wasn't, uh, she wasn't necessarily supportive, but she didn't hold me back at all in any way. My dad was extremely supportive, always having talks with me about um, the mental aspect of um honing in on those ideas and concepts. And yeah, he was a good artist as well. And my brother, uh, my oldest brother was a, a great artist as well. So I got to see just like, not even a lot, just I remember seeing one drawing from my brother and he brought it home from school and it was of a duck. And I would stare at that thing all day and like a single drawing from my dad, I would just stare at it all day and it would just, it, it got to me, you know. Sure. But but ultimately you didn't go to like a formal art school. I think you, you went to like a year at some school before leaving to go into the commercial sector. What what school was that that you, you started to go to? So I had started going to Pasadena City College. I had picked there because the instructors were from Art Center. Okay. And so the plan was that they were going to help me get into Art Center. But fortunately lightning in a bottle. I had a friend that was a producer at Disney and I, he opened the door for me to skip school and still learn, but informally. Sure. And so do you, do you wish that you, I guess, continued that track or do you, I mean, it sounds like you feel like the real world experience ended up being more valuable in the end. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I am where I am 
I respect that my process was that of the road that I took. I got to skip a lot of debt. That that was pretty awesome. Um, I do recognize that what I missed out in school was um, the connections, but then I got connections elsewhere. Yeah, I don't, I mean, like, there's definitely a part of me that would have been interested in, oh, that would have been fun. Actually, now, I always joke that, like, if I come into a zillion dollars, I would actually probably go to school. I would be interested in, and again, this goes back to the whole, like, I'm using the same deodorant as my dad. <laughs> I, my running shoes are New Balance because that's what my dad ran with. And the fact that I would want to go back to school, it's what my dad did. Par- paralleling <laughs> so your father, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, no, I, I love, I love the fact that, um, I essentially skip school. I am, I am a staunch believer, extreme supporter of school. My ki- I have kids and I want them in school. None of them want to do school because they're like, well, you didn't do school and look how that mm. turned out. Um, but I am, I heavily believe in being educated and constantly learning, being a perpetual student. So whether you're formally trained or informally trained, learning is is the key and it never stops it should never stop yeah no that that's that's important to remember i think the, the most you know the, the people that have the most uh, to to offer the the world i think are people that are constantly thinking like that you know constantly open to new experiences and 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 stuff so i, I want to dive into the experience with disney because that was sort of the, i guess the next step in your career and, and a big a huge component of your career uh, is the work that you've done in the commercial sector, you know, working on various advertising projects with huge brands like MTV and Universal Pictures and Microsoft. Um, and this job at Disney, I guess you originally, from what I understand, you were designing like kid friendly websites in like what was the early days of the Internet. Right. Um, for Dis- Disney Interactive. Did that did that sort of act as a launching pad for you into the commercial sector? Was that the gateway? I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Like it was, again, I caught lightning in a bottle, but in a major way, I was put onto a team of six people whose sole job it was to essentially propel Disney, the corporation as a whole into this thing called the internet. So animating on the internet didn't exist. Um, there was this art center, former art center teacher. Her name was Linda Weinman. And she was extremely connected in the sense that she wanted to act as a go-between with people that she knew that was creating technologies and the friends that were designers that she knew of. And she wanted to like get them working together. And so There was this gentleman, I forget his name. Everyone listening to this probably knows his name, but he had created um, this thing called uh, GIF Animator. Like the, he was the guy that created GIF Animation. And I'm sure people listening are going to argue that it's GIF Animation. Right. But I say, (laughs) say I say GIF Animation. I do too. Yeah. Yeah. And so literally like hot off the press, she brought it over to the studio because everyone knew that if, we, this young team adopted it, then the industry as a whole would use it as standard because Disney was using it. So they would take technologies over to either to us or to Microsoft. And so we got a lot of fresh technology. And so I always like to joke and say that for Disney, for sure, I was the first person to ever animate on the internet. And then like internet wise, like before that animation was um, done through server pushing, So it would ping back the server and slowly just refresh rates and refresh uh, a scene by scene animation. And it was like really taxing and you had to have like a T1 line in order to see the animation. But when she brought over this GIF animation tool, I was designing at the time uh, for Hollywood Records and I did an animation of a kid stomping on a city. And it was my whole career was at, it was like, we started, uh, they brought over this technology called future splash. 
And it was a young company and they would fly us down to San Diego and they would help, we would help them develop it so that we could then implement it and use it. Oh, wow. And then we can, one of the guys on our team convinced Microsoft to buy, no, um, Macromedia to buy the company. And then they changed the name to Flash. To Flash. Okay. And, but we were like the first, one of the first groups to ever use it and to ever, um, animate with it and design with it. So it was, it was like a lot of firsts. That's what amazing. Were, was happening at Disney and the area I was at. So, I mean, yeah. Then to your original point about it being a learning experience, I, I imagine you you got you got exposed to things that you never could have imagined. You know, you never could have gotten in going to a traditional art school. No, absolutely not. And there were um, even then there were teachers, former professors, because they were. <laughs> How they hired me is an anomaly, <laughs> but everyone else they hired were like really seasoned professionals that were like former professors elsewhere. And so I would sneak in like an hour before work and just ask them like, Hey, can you teach me this 3d program? Can you teach me that? And so I got my, I got my lessons in for sure. How long did you um, work for Disney? Mm, I was there, I believe maybe five years. Those years though felt like, 30 because it really was my my those were my formative years like i learned everything there which was cool uh, i left because i wanted to um i wanted to be an adult i felt like i because everything was designing for children and being safe and i wanted to design bad stuff okay and i wanted <laughs> to more than anything i wanted to use the color black and so that didn't afford me to do that at Disney. And so I went and worked for agencies where I, I started working on um, more adult content, like designing for spirits and wines or um, video games and just fun stuff. Was that, was that for Pittard Sullivan? I know you went there for, for a bit after Disney. Is that the, the next step in your trajectory, I guess? Yeah, I went there just for a short spell. I was pretty young and immature still, and that didn't work out. And then I went directly after that. I went to, I believe I, I might have went to Trick Media. Um, but again, like all all of that, like all those agencies, it's all a blur in that it's all it's all the same work, same clients, Sony, more Disney. I like you asked me like, well, when did I leave Disney? I haven't left Disney. <laughs> You're still Everyone I work with and for, they're all Disney people. And like the last Disney project I worked on was, um, I got to, um, art direct TV spots for, uh, Disney junior. So they don't, um, they don't advertise on Disney junior because the channels for like five year olds. And so they take, they essentially take their logo and just animate it using all the different properties under the Disney umbrella. And so I got to do storyboards and art direct, like a CG team to do like these really cute, fun animations of the logo, doing different things dressed up in different ways, like the Peter Pan version, the Cinderella version. And so I feel like I will forever be, which I love. The, <laughs> I love, love, love Disney. So it's not an issue for me. Well, as much as they keep growing, I mean, pretty much everything is under Disney at this point. So <laughs> There's no escaping. It's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> so, so at some point, you partnered with Alex Liu at 3Pin Media, which eventually merged into 42 Entertainment. So I guess, how did you meet Alex and get that going? I met Alex in Jones Junior High in the band room. Oh, okay. And he was a clarinet player. At the time, and I was a trumpet player. So you've known him for a long time then. Okay. Junior high, yeah. Wow. And then we ended up in summer school, in high school, and I had a bunch of drawings out. And he was like, those are cool drawings. And I was like, do you draw too? And he's like, yeah. I'm all, did we just become best friends? <laughs> 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 and so, yeah, we've, I... That six person team at Disney, I called him up one day and I, he was working as a designer, a young designer at the LA Times. And I called him up and I said, quit what you're doing and come down here right now. And that was it. He, he made a career out of it. So what, what was a uh, three pin media? Uh, what was that company? 
So, um, uh, I, I hope Alex listens to this podcast. <laughs> this is really funny. So, I was at Disney one day, and he walks up behind me as I'm sitting in my chair. I was being just totally involved, like deep concentration into my work, minding my own business. And he came up behind me with like the devil horns drawn with evil intentions. He wraps his arm around my neck and then just like completely slams me to the floor. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I, and then he kind of like steps back and I'm sitting there on the floor and I look up at him and I go, Alex, I go, you better run. Like you need to (laughs) run right now. And mind you, like I grew up doing judo. I grew up wrestling, like grappling's my thing. I love fighting. And he's like, he's like, dude, look, we both know that you could kick my butt. So you getting up and doing anything to me, like, like, really? It's just your pride at this point. Like, let it go. And I'm like, no, like, you need to run. So <laughs> he didn't. I stood up. I went after him. And then again, he he attacks me again. He grabs me um, by my shirt and then pins me up against the wall. And so, like, wrestler mode jumps in. I duck under. I get to his back. And I suplex him. <laughs> and he lands on the floor and he snaps his arm. And so it took three pins to put his arm back together. Oh, wow. (laughs) And so that started three pins. (laughs) We left Disney and we wanted to work for ourselves. And he was like, well, if I'm going to, if we're going to do anything, we're going to, we're going to call it three pin and the logo is going to be the x-ray from the hospital when, when you broke my arm after I violently attacked (laughs) So (laughs) it's incredible. Um, So, I mean, Ultimately, that merged into 40 or to entertainment. So were, were the kind of projects that you're working on in 3Pin Media, was it sort of a precursor to the sort of stuff you ended up doing for 42 or was it totally different? Totally different because 42 was unique in itself in that um, they invented um, this genre known as ARGS, alternate reality gaming. And so before that, 3Pin, we were just doing like anything that we can get our hands on. We were designing shoes. We were designing for foes, um, downhill mountain bikes to intense bikes. We were, we designed for, oh man, current TV was a project that Al Gore had put together in partnership, I believe with maybe, maybe Google, I forget who it was, but they wanted to create a news channel that was, geared towards like the MTV generation, like really fun hip. And so we did like all the motion graphics for it, the motion design to help launch the channel. So like it was literally like we did, it was just a design agency. Just And so 42 at the time needed to partner with a, a group to do visuals. And we worked on the first project with them for Microsoft. And they dis- they asked us to dissolve our company and take us in. So Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And I, I've actually known about 40 or two, two, excuse me, 42 entertainment way before I got involved or became knowledgeable about the art community, just from what you guys did with nine inch nails and anybody that like knows me or even remotely well knows that I'm a huge nerd for <laughs> everything that Trent Reznor puts his hands on. Yeah. So, um, I'm probably going to nerd out a little bit on that. Uh, but I guess, you know, just to give some context and some background on, on what you guys did in that project, um, you know, Nine Inch Nails around 2007 came out with their Year Zero album, um, which, you know, all Nine Inch Nails projects tend to be very conceptual and have a kind of a world around them. Um, but what you guys brought to the table was expanding that concept into the real world and actually created this ARG, um, fleshing out the concepts of the album Um which were like all about this imagined dystopia where it was like this parallel world where every, which ended up becoming very close to where we actually have today. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Frighteningly so. (laughs) Um, But it was super immersive and like, like there was, you know, hidden bits of audio that had images in the spectral view. And there was like hidden websites for, um, you know, pharmaceutical companies that were kind of controlling people. It was just this super immersive experience that a a whole community was built around, which was, I've, I've never seen anything like it like before, or since. So how did that project get started? And how, how did you guys connect, I guess, with Reznor and, and, and just the project itself come together? 
Uh, so one, I like hearing you talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know enough about it. That was cool. I liked hearing you kind of give the replay. That was awesome. It was a huge <laughs> thing. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, also, uh, I'm, I've always been fairly limited as to what I say about all that stuff. Uh, we always, I don't know. Almost, I felt like the majority of my career and everything that I've ever really worked on, I'm not really allowed to talk about it. Um, but you should really have Alex on here. And that would be an easy thing to get him on here. And he would talk your ear off and he would know what to say and not to say. But what I can say is that I believe the story goes is that um, Trent Reznor had played I Love Bees. And I Love Bees had been the launch, the first campaign that 42 had ever built, which was launching the Halo, the video game Halo. And it, that one in itself was like crazy ass revolutionary. They were doing things that had never been done before. And it was really immersive and had gotten like a, a huge audience. And he was a big fan of it. And so he called up through like the business line one day and he got our, our business manager and they put the call through to the CEO and whatnot. And I just remember getting a call. I think I remember hearing about it before Alex had heard about it. Mind you, uh, to retract, when I had met Alex, um, I would say it's fair to say that just about every day I would see him he had a nine inch nail shirt on. <laughs> he, Alex had been to every single, oh, this is, this is going to be fun because I get to embarrass him, I guess. <laughs> he had been to every single nine inch nail, anything and everything, like went to like a, a fan signing event one day. And <laughs> this is really funny because this, this maybe isn't stuff that he would want people to know. <laughs> but he had, uh, just, you know, he got to talking to Trent at this fan geek out signing session and Trent under his breath goes, you know, hey man, you know, we're in New Orleans now because they had, I guess they had left the, um, the Manson helm where they had felt, um, recorded that, the album where they, the Mansons had killed the tapes. Right. And they took off to New Orleans. Interesting story. I had learned that the door to the house for the tape murder, they took the door with them. And I guess they had used it in New Orleans, which is pretty dark. Um, I believe it was the door that had pig written on it. Anyways, uh, and he says under his breath, uh, yeah, just, you know, come down to New Orleans and hang out with us. <laughs> And I think Alex, <laughs> young Alex is like, oh, really? Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so months later, Alex knocks on his door at the studio in New Orleans. And he's like, who are you? <laughs> oh, you said come down and hang out. Oh, I did. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's, I'll give you a tour. Uh, so, yeah, that was Alex. Alex is all about Nine Inch Nails. Everything I've ever heard know about the band is because of Alex. And so getting this call uh, from Susan, the head of the agency, oh, we got a call from Nine Inch Nails. And I was like, oh, Alex is going to lose his mind. And sure enough, like, I think it was, I think he might have felt like a, a prank was being played on him. But that's how it came about. And it was Alex, we all, we always talk about like our dream projects what would be like the number one agency or not agency, but property that you or artist that you would love to work with. And for me, like my number one would have been Bob Marley. No chance of that ever happening. Maybe working with is the property, but never with Bob Marley. But for Alex, it had been nine inch nails. And that happened. That's amazing. So, and and I mean the the slogan uh, "Art is Resistance" is something that came out of that campaign, and I, I know you've reused it, you know, recently in, in a charity event that you put together, um, which would sort of suggest that it it became this personal uh, or it developed a personal connection with it. I guess D does it? Do you feel like if you have personal investment in something like Alex did with Nine Inch Nails or like with the slogan, do you feel like it makes the project better? I believe so. I I think when that was created, it was. Like, look, ultimately, the work that we did, it was to sell something. 
where we are, what we were generating was in place of magazine ads, billboards. We create things that allow users to more engage and become the flag wavers of whatever it is that we're selling. A new movie, Dark Knight, or the Year Zero album. However, when Art is Resistance was created, it was a genuine, um, like, we really feel strongly about this. Because Trent really felt strongly about this. So, yes, something is being sold, but everyone really believes in the idea and the concept. Everyone really fears the idea of living in what we're living in today and doing something to try and prevent it. Yeah, it is an interesting dynamic, just the the way that y- you guys approach advertising and that you know, you're, you're also contributing to the story itself. You know, you're not just trying to sell the thing, but you're also contributing to it. Um, I, I guess, how does that usually work where you have you know, your own ideas integrating with the concepts of your clients? Because um, you know, it seems a lot more tightly coupled or a lot more uh, collaborative than a traditional you know, advertising company where you're just putting stuff out that has already been created, you know, effectively. Yeah, that is not my department. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I get to, I get once in a while, like um, when I really connect with the property, I get to um, put in my two cents, but we have very talented writers. We have like Alex who really do deep dives into story. So I guess my example would be when Star Wars Clone Wars came out, the animated series, it was telling you the story before the movie. And so when we work on properties, it's always fun to have some agency to be able to, um, they trust us enough where they allow us to write some into the canon, add to the canon. So that's, it's we're pretty fortunate in that. Yeah. Because we're, we're touching things like Batman, The Dark Knight, or Year Zero, the album, and we're adding to it. So it's it's actually pretty special. Yeah, that must be a, a you know, I have to think that's that's an incredible experience just to be able to think outside of the box on these projects um, with such, you know, talented creatives. Um, your, your particular role is VP of Visual Design. So what does that exactly involve? Like, what, what is your role with these types of projects? Uh, I would say... Pretty much what it sounds like. Um, I'm the glorified designer, visual guy, cr- helping create and form what something looks like. The branding, essentially. So, I mean, I, there's not, it's not really, I wish there was something more, a more sexier way to describe that. But essentially, it's trying to be the visual support to everything that the writers are putting together. Very cool. Um, and, and around the same time as, I guess, that project and 42 Entertainment itself brought you guys in, um, you know, from 3Pin Media, uh, was when you launched your own personal art career. Like, you know, you started to really teach yourself to paint and, and really start developing a body of work yourself that, that you cared about. Um, uh, I, I guess what prompted that decision to explore your own art more? Um, you know, because on the surface, it seems like you have a pretty kick ass career in the corporate world. Like, what what did you think was missing in that commercial work that you wanted to fill with this interest in the gallery work? Uh, so I am, I, I think I went into my career fairly blind. Um, I didn't fully understand what was, what the options were for me in this world of just being a creative in general. I was kind of thrown into being a graphic designer and it worked out and I was really happy. Had I known maybe a little more about my options of maybe being an entertainment designer or an illustrator or a painter, maybe I might have made some different decisions. Uh, so I find my, I find myself as a graphic designer. I am very much, I like playing the support role. I like being, I like telling a client or people that are asking me to do whatever design work. I, you tell me how high you want me to jump. I'll do my best. I love, love, I guess a simple way of putting it. I love serving um, clients and 
helping them get to somewhere even better than they had imagined. I was only able to take so much of that because it's ultimately trying my best to fulfill other people's dreams, right? Right. And I, at the time, I, my jumping into pain had started before that. I, I won't talk about who this was, but I was at an agency shortly before I ended up partnering full-time with like 42 or else, but they had for the first time in my career, they had made me feel like maybe I made a mistake. They made me regret being a designer and I got extremely depressed and I was upset with myself for allowing someone to make me feel this way for giving them uh, power over me. And it was ultimately my fault because again, my tendency in my nature is to like, I want to serve to the fullest and then to serve to your fullest and then to be made to feel a certain way. It was really frustrating. And so what I decided was that I wanted to, um, I'm watching my cat and he's going after a little gnat. It's so cute because he's like, <laughs> he's being a, a, a King Kong on the Eiffel Tower. He's like, <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. I'm an artist. I easily get distracted. <laughs> no, that's cute. So I, I wanted to create something for me. I wanted to be absolutely fully in control of um, my own destiny. I wanted to tell my stories. I wanted to have something where um, I had 100% full agency over my creative where no one can step in and say, you can't do that. Let me control. Because I was, my whole career at that point was, what can, what do you tell me what you want? I will do it for you and I'm there 100% for you. And so I was, I had um, a friend in the seventh letter group and he started taking me around and introducing me to art that I had never really seen before. And it just sparked. It was, he was just a spark. He ignited something in me like pretty early on. So what was that transition like? I guess, was it a sudden sort of like recognition that this, you wanted this to be a bigger part of your life or was it something you sort of gradually incorporated over time, um, you know, over the course of like several years? Well, uh, this is going to sound awfully arrogant and I'm just, I want to be honest as possible. I don't, I believe it was lightning fast. I think it was like, I had never painted before. I took paint to a piece of wood. And then within my like third, my second painting, I had put it in front of a gallery and they were like, yes. Oh, wow. It, like it was scary fast. But again, like I had, I don't, you know, I'm a firm believer. I, I don't, um, I don't subscribe to the idea that men or women are self-made. I think that along your journey that there is someone loving and giving that is there in some form or another that opens doors for you. And that's been my career ultimately, um, especially my commercial career. Someone opened the door for me to go and work at Disney. And then um, there was a handful of people that had known that I was painting that op helped open the door for me. One in particular was Thomas Hahn. And he had seen my work, he was like one of the first people to ever see my work. And he was like, I need to introduce you to some people. And it was through that where it was, again, it just, it snowballed like really fast. How did you go about learning um, to paint? I mean, time frame wise, this is like what, mid to early 2000s, I guess. So you may not have had as many resources as people like today would have. How did you go about learning? Um, so I think I learned to paint through all my work at Disney. I think it was um, a Photoshop, just learning how to use color and paint and layer. It's just a concept. So now I'm taking that concept and that foundation that I have, and I'm just translating it to um, something that's living and breathing in a sense that is temperamental. That's, um, and I'm still learning constantly. As I'm talking to you, I'm thinking about how, like, uh, 
in Photoshop, there's nothing's wet, but in real life, everything is wet and slick and dries fast or doesn't dry fast. And um, some surfaces have more teeth, tooth than others. And so it's just constantly like just learning. Mm. And so, but the, the core is one, I know how to create and I have the ideas. And then the, uh, the rest of it, it's just technical stuff and the learning curve. You could get over it, anything, literally anything within in the creative world within a month or two or three. But in my case, uh, that's, I don't, that's a misrepresenting myself. It's been, I don't know how many years, over 20 years, I'm still learning. And I feel like I have a, a long way to go, but to get to, that first point to where I think I'm connecting sentences that you can read um, pretty fast because I had a strong foundation already. How did you, um, I guess, how did you make time for that while, while you were still working for, you know, these adver- advertising agencies, how did you make time to, to learn? Uh, don't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't sleep, man. I don't, I don't believe I'm not a party guy. I don't go to clubs. I don't, I'm not, uh, drinker. I don't have friends. I don't go out and socialize. And I just, I lock myself in and it's as simple as that. So, you know, you, you added, um, you know, gallery work in your personal painting, um, because you felt that there was something missing from your corporate work. Would you ever want to continue that to where your entire career was your personal work? Or do you need that client connection that you were talking about earlier where you like to please your clients? And do you need, I guess, the contrast between those? I think that I will eventually get there. I'm not there yet. Um, I'm still working on projects that I'm really stoked about. Um, But ultimately... I, you know, when I take, like, because I do take vacations, and a lot of times when I take vacations, I just spend it painting, or if, like, I'm traveling to go paint somewhere, and I get a glimpse of being a full-time artist, and man, it's a, what a life. I'm jealous of my friends that get to do it full-time, and would I like to be there? Yes, that would be amazing. I would love that. Awesome. I mean, do you have like a, have you thought about what it would take to get to that point? Or is it more just a, an idea that you, you find attractive? Yeah, I think a lot would have to happen. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard, man, because, you know, I think you, as I don't know if it's necessarily a creative problem, um, but you, uh, how to answer this question, because I don't want to talk about money, but the truth is like, Look, I'm, I've been working, when you work as a designer in the agency world, you make really good money. And when you make good money, it's like you have that apartment that's um, 500 square feet and you grow to that size, but then you get an apartment with 1200 square feet and then you grow your things and belongings to that. I've financially, I've grown to... I've put myself in a situation to where, in a sense, I have to make a certain amount of money. And so there's like, it carries a little bit of sadness. Like I, at the beginning of my career, it was, I was like, Oh, like I'm, I didn't go to school and I'm a young punk, 19, 18 year old. And I make more than my brothers and sisters who have master's degree. And they all thought that I was going to fail in life. So then it, for a while there, for many years, it became about like, how do I make more money? And every time I transitioned from an agency to another, it was always like getting big, huge raises and it became about money. And then I finally realized like it's not about money. It's about working on creative projects and you're limited when your burn rate or what you're expected to make is too high. So you kind of money means that you work on less cool things. And so I kind of screwed myself in that sense. Mm-hmm. Cause you, I guess you've, you've set yourself up, I guess, become accustomed to a certain lifestyle yeah. and you know, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So I'm weaning myself off. Uh, I'll say that I'm definitely weaning myself off and, but it, it's going to take 
it's taking years to do that. Sure, sure. Um, so, you know, like you said, you know, when you first started really, um, I guess, wanting to express yourself and started to paint, it, it came together very quickly. And, and it seems like almost like a year later, you started, you know, you actually had your own solo show with ThinkSpace. Uh, 2007, I guess, was full of grace. Um, was that your first time showing your work in a gallery setting or had you shown even before then? I had shown before then. I had shown in a group show at um, Project with Bo. So, Thomas Hahn had introduced me to Bo, and that was my first time showing in one of the galleries out on that side within that group of galleries, like the new places, the think spaces, and projects and whatnot. Um, and it was through projects that I had met the Hosners and jumped over to think space. Okay. And, and a really strong, another really strong gallery relationship that you've had and shown at several times is, is Mary Kanowski's KP projects. Um, and I believe your first show there was in 2012, you know, several years later. Um, how did you first connect with Mary and, and develop that relationship? She had, I had met her through just being a geek and a fan of the gallery. Like, to me, it was like the pinnacle or the ultimate place because of who she was showing. And so I was faithfully there at every single show and got to talk to her and let her know that I was creating art. And she, in a, in a weird way, kind of started acting as a mentor. And anytime I had questions and concerns, she would lend me her ear and she acted as kind of like a mom. Um, then. After a while, the, the conversation came up of, well, I'd like to show here, but she was honest. She's always very honest and was like, well, I'm, I'm watching. You don't realize it, but I'm, I'm listening and I'm watching and I'm paying attention. And when the time's right, we'll have that conversation. That's awesome. That's, that's cool that, that she's had that sort of presence. Um, and I guess, do you feel in general it's, um, it's important or necessary to have a strong gallery relationship like that? Absolutely. I really, really do. I, she's uh, my friend now, and I really covet my relationship with her. I think that she's a wealth of information, and again, like I, I feel as strongly about the gallery as I did back when she was showing, like Shepard Ferry or Camille or whatnot. Like I, I love that space to death, and I, I don't know. I think I. I'm a big, big fan of um, championing women. And I think I do really well um, working for women. I don't know if that, how relevant that is in this conversation, but she has a, a special way of um, talking to me and I really listen to where she's coming from. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, and so let's dive into the work itself. Um, you know, but but first, I'm super curious to know about the KMNDZ name or Command Z. Um, and and sort of embarrassing because for the for many many years, um, I didn't realize it was Command Z. I having been a fan of industrial music, I've had decades of experience with KMFDM. <laughs> and, so, and so when I first saw you know, five capital letters starting with K and M, I'm thinking in that, in those terms. So I'm thinking yeah. it's an acronym. It's some kind of an acronym. And I never connected it until I talked to Greg just a few months ago. And he said, my buddy Command Z. And, and I was literally just, my mind would kind of blew. I was like, Command Z, who is? And then I was like, <laughs> I was like wow, I had no idea. Um, and it's, you know, it's that connection with KMFDM is why I experienced it that way. But I guess, where did that the command Z name come from? And, and was that, I guess, did you adopt that or incorporate that when you first started your painting career or was it even before then that you, that you had that name? All right. So before I answer that, I mean, I apologize to the artist, but how amazing are KMFDM album covers? <laughs> I mean, as a kid, I remember just sitting there and just going like, wow, yeah. this style so amazing so bold graphical yeah it's a and, and the fact that it was the same artist throughout every album it created this visual consistency that you can't yeah you knew yeah. like oh that's a that's kmfdm when you're at tower records flipping through stuff so 
Command Z. You want the full Genesis? You want to know what it means and how? Yeah, it I'm just came? curious when you first started, when, yeah. when you first adopted. I know a little bit about what it kind of means to you, but like I don't know like how it began. Yeah, I. So I look. I wanted to. Um, I'm a big fan of finding moments in my life where I get to fly my freak flag or be uh, like a superhero. When I ride motorcycles, the way I dress. If I'm like in a full black leather suit, I feel like a Power Ranger. I like my superhero moments. And as an artist, I wanted to have a name that made me feel like a superhero in a sense. I wanted to, I, it's important to me to be as, give as much of me as possible and to tell my story. And so I was at a DRI gig and DRI's um, Dirty Rotten Imbeciles. It's a punk band. And it was out, what was that? It was out in Van Nuys. And uh, my best friends were a group of three brothers. And the oldest brother took me to the gig. And the younger brothers were inside. And the concert had already, or the gig had already sold out. And a scalper came up and sold us one ticket. So we only had one ticket. And so I took the ticket, went inside and the other brother just went home. And like it, it were, it's just moments like that, that I've carried like all my life where I'm constantly remembering that situation because up until today, I feel like absolute trash for it. I feel so horrible. I wish that, um, I had let him go in there to be with his brother. I wish that we had not bought that ticket and I wish that we had snuck in or I wish that we just went and grabbed a bite to eat and just talked. But I hate the fact that I was so selfish that I took the ticket and went inside. And that that informed Command Z. Because I ultimately wanted to, um, again be as personal as possible. I wanted to tell my story because I, this is what I believe. I believe art is very derivative. I believe that you can only paint so many uh, cars or birds or buildings um, or portraits before you're like, well, I mean, it all starts to, um, meld together and this style looks like that style i think where art um becomes unique is the stories in which artists are telling that are unique to them if an artist is being honest and they are willing to share that because that's very difficult to expose yourself and so i knew that i needed to expose myself as much as possible so command z um again Going back to my commercial world, command Z's means undo, right? It means if I'm designing something and I make a mistake, I hit command Z, it undoes an action. And it's pure. It's absolute. Absolute meaning what it is. It's perfect. It undoes something as though it never existed before. That's what command Z does. So it's my way of recognizing that in real life, that just does not exist. If I offend you, I can say sorry. And you can say, I forgive you. But you're human. And you will always have it in your mind that although you forgave me, that I am that guy that offended you. And that I am capable of doing that. And so in real life, an absolute undoing of an action does not exist. And so it's me being mindful of how I behave, how I treat people, the actions and the things that I do essentially never, it's learning from my past so that I'm not repeating it. And so that's where that comes from. Yeah, that's powerful. And was it something that you, you started using when you started exploring your own personal artwork or did you, did it predate even that? I would say simultaneously. Um, no. Oh, so how it worked was that um, I, I haven't talked about this in a long time. I knew that I wanted to paint. I took one whole year 
of meditating and thinking about who I am before I went into painting. Cause I didn't want to go into it and cause I've been drawing all my life. I'd been, I've been doing a lot of painting in Photoshop and creating work. I was, I like, I have like really like when I was at Disney in the nineties, I remember like I painted robots. I rendered robots um, digitally. And so when you ask how I learned how to paint, I was already painting a lot in Photoshop. And I did a lot of robots because that's what I had grown up around. And they didn't mean anything. And so when I, I knew that I was going to get into painting, again, I just took that time to really think about how I wanted to be represented, who I am and what I was going to say. So once I finally started painting, I already I was already loaded, locked and loaded. I already knew that I wanted to be Command Z and that 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 carried X message with it. Oh, that's amazing. Um, and, and you mentioned robots and, and robots do appear in your work now, um, you know, pretty frequently. Um, I guess what do they represent a certain like archetype or personality or what's the, the significance of the robots in your work today? Sometimes I feel like it, it fluctuates and changes, but ultimately there had been a story that I created, which is the command Z story. It's essentially the robots are helping tell the command Z story, which is they are storytellers, these robots and the society in which, or the story that I created, there's the society in the future this dystopian future <laughs> where we had gotten to a place to where we lo- were losing our humanity and we've lost our way. And these robots were carrying these stories and reminding us of these stories so that we wouldn't forget them so that we'd be reminded of our humanity and they would roam the earth essentially. And you would be able to walk up to these robots and essentially say like, well, tell me your story robot. And they would, you could either like a view master look inside their chest or they could project onto a wall or whatever. And they would remind you of stories like Gandhi, uh, Dracula, or um, Jesus Christ, uh, like whatever it is from literature to real life stories to comics, whatever it is, just things that would remind us that help build our character. So that's what they, they were just agents of, or just tools and capsules carrying stories. I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, they, they do, they have, they obviously have a lot of wear, you know, you you can tell they've been around for a while. So I think the way that you described it, I think makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Um, another, another component of your work that, that appears quite a lot is, is birds. Um, but not like Autobahn, like you're not depicting scenes from nature. They're, they're more like characters in your story. Um, I guess what do they represent and are they a different, I guess, agent within this larger world that you've been building? Ultimately, I, I do remember that I wanted to bring in more, um, organic elements into my work. And through that, I needed to explore. It just couldn't be, I'm bringing in a bird for the sake of bringing in a bird. I had to be able to tell, or they had to be able to add to the story. And so I have always been a big fan of um, scripture and stories through scripture. And in scripture, it talks about the fowl of the air. What was the scripture? I don't remember the exact scripture. But it talked about how if they are fed on a daily basis through just everyday, daily, like whatever scraps they can find, then you would essentially be taken care of as well. Uh, Like I'm really chopping this up. Like it's been so long. Yeah, I I need to really like maybe I have notes where I can really – look back and figure out like where that originally had started, but it did come from scripture and they were acting as agents of um, the, the idea of not worrying because if they were fed on a daily basis, then you would be fed as well. So it was something along those lines. Yeah. I've, I feel like a dork for not fully remembering. 
Yeah, no worries. Um, I mean, but you know, one constant kind of theme that that we see with the birds in your work is that they're often wearing or nesting in you know various repurposed artifacts like bombs or grenades. A lot, a lot of them are, are kind of war related, um, you know, artifacts. So I guess where did that motif come from, and what does that represent? Is it sort of a nature reclaiming Earth motif, or is it an anti war message? What is the the significance there? I think it fluctuates, and even like the type of bird that I paint. Um, like if I paint a starling, which is like a newer thing for me, then it it essentially represents the story of the starling and how they came to be in the United States. And have you ever heard that story? No, no, I haven't. So they're they're not an indigenous bird to the United States, and some Englishmen had brought them over, not realizing that they were a very invasive species that essentially like took out like an entire ecosystem in New York and it really hurt the ecosystem in a really bad way. And so if I paint birds like that, then a lot of times you kind of have to research like their history and it helps tell you like what I was trying to say with birds and specifically that were that carry bombs or dropping bombs that it, it feeds into the canon that I had been creating about the society of robots that along that there were birds that had been essentially taking um, these bombs that were being dropped out of, out of the air and capturing them before they were exploding and ripping out all their insides and repurposing them. All of that came from, first, it originally came from my dad in that he went to war. And then when he came back from war, he made me promise him that I wouldn't sign up to go to war. Because it was definitely, I think, a trajectory or an option in my life at the time. And so my my wanting to go to war was substituted with visually depicting that by painting about it, essentially. So a lot of it had to do with like losing my dad to war and stuff like that. And then later it transitioned over into um, going through like the worst breakup divorce that I had ever gone through. That's a weird way of saying that. Um, That person that I had divorced, the relationship had became like beyond toxic, even in the process of the breakup. And those bombs represented the hate that was being thrown at me. And so when those birds were catching those bombs and ripping out all the, the mechanical, the internals represented hate. And their response was not to throw the bombs back at the sender, but to repurpose them into homes and love, essentially. So again, it all goes back to just, you're asking me really hard questions because I have to um, really think about where I was in the mindset. And as I'm talking, like it's all coming back to me. Because I remember at first I was painting because of my dad and the wars that he had gone through and making me promise that I wouldn't go to war, but I wanted to paint about that instead. And then it transitioned over into going through like this really horrible personal um, moment in my life. And of course, because I'm committed to just being as honest and open as possible, I'm like talking to you about it. Like, I don't know that it's hard. It's hard to talk about that stuff, but it's honest. And again, like I've seen a lot of guys paint birds with bombs, but when I paint it, it's super unique to my story. It's unique to my experience through my breakup and what they represent, you know. As rich as, as narrative is in, in the work that you create and as personal as those stories are, um, I guess, how do you feel about intent versus reception? Like as far as the narrative go, like it's important to you that the, the people that see your work um, understand a lot of those stories that you're telling, or is it just that you want to get it off your chest and however they interpret it is a, is not a big concern. It's not a big concern at all. Like I genuinely, like I think if anything, I find great joy in people looking at the work and coming up with their own story. I was at, um, I'll tell this story without using names or places. <laughs> Cause I don't know how it'll go over, but I was at, I was invited to a mixer and this mixer was for, um, young, wealthy professionals 
and I was at a gallery and I had a really large piece hanging in the gallery. And, you know, there was young people there, suit and tie, and this one gentleman, young guy, maybe like 25, had like four or five girls around him and he was standing in front of my piece and he was he was trying to impress them. He was peacocking a bit much. <laughs> and he was just going on about like like talking about what the numbers meant and what the birds had meant. And he was just creating his own story. And I was just like, this is amazing. And I didn't <laughs> want to like, because someone was like, dude, you should like just step in and talk about it. And I was like, no, like why? Like uh, I love hearing what he had to say. I think what's really beautiful about art is you can look at anything and just make up whatever you want. And you are absolutely in the right to do that. Especially if you don't have the artist in front of you or a book or a letter talking about describing what it is that you're looking at. And that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. And it's all awesome. But if you have the opportunity to sit down with the artist and then it becomes that conversation, like if you're willing to ask, I'm willing to tell you. And I think that allows me just to connect with people. I, again, like I'm not, um, if I can, I'm good with living the hermit life. And so painting has uh, forced me to break out of that and talk to people, especially when it comes to like, well, what does that mean? I'm like, All right. I'm in. I will sit here for however long it takes and explain to you what's going on. At that same show, I remember there was a painting uh, by William Ray, and it was of Superman walking to his job on Hollywood Boulevard in front of the Man's Chinese Theater. And it was a painting of him in that very moment of being human, it was some just regular dude walking somewhere in a Superman costume. And I remember I was standing there looking at it. And in that mixer, this young woman walks up and she's looking at it. And she, because I was standing there, she goes, I really hate this painting. I don't get it. And I was like, oh, like, that's, that's fair. I'm all, have you talked to the artist? Have you tried to figure out like what the intent was? She goes, no, I haven't. I'm all, well, can I tell you what I believe to be the intent? And I explained that to her, that it was him capturing the moment of a man dressed in a Superman costume walking to go pretend to be Superman, this guy that's supposed to be the most powerful being in our solar system that flies everywhere. And once she kind of started thinking about that, she goes, this is now my favorite piece in oh, wow. the gallery. And so, yeah, I'm, for me, I don't really care what... Uh, look, I'm... My last show, I had so much story and I think maybe like 2% of the audience got to really sit with me and understand it and learn it. And it was very laboring. Like it took a lot of effort to like, I had a bunch of talks and uh, Cheryl so much with it. And I was just really taxing on me. And now this show that I'm, I'm probably jumping ahead in this conversation, but now like this next show that I'm working on. I, I just want to create pretty works. Like I, there is story there because it's inherent and there's symbolism and there's a lot of me in it. And so everything means something, but there's not this arc like in my last show, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's very, it's very liberating to just create for the sake of creating something pretty and not necessarily having this heavy, heavy, deep meaning, which again, it's hard to walk away from because now that I'm thinking about some of the pieces in the show, like there is meaning in everything. So sure. Sure. I, I guess one thing that I'm fascinated by with, with people that have a strong focus on narrative like you and Greg and, and tell these large stories, um, I guess, does your process for developing a story for a large body of work differ than if it's just a single painting for like a group, sh group, group show. So like the, the macro versus micro level story development, how, how does, how do they play with one another or, or is it all the same process and it's all just part of this big narrative? I think it's part of a big narrative. Cause I, so like if I'm creating for like a small show, 
And it's also me being lazy because <laughs> it's so easy to go like, all right, I have to create this one piece. So what do I paint? Yeah, I like I paint birds and um, flowers. All right. Uh, what flower? Um, birds of paradise. So, yeah. But those all mean something and they all have a place within the story. And so I I find it's pretty hard for me to like break away from that and to create something that isn't part of that larger story i'll do it but i i think i'm more interested in um being consistent in that way one of my favorite movies that i always go back to is basquiat and there's a scene where benicio is playing basketball with um basquiat and he talks about like well how do you become famous like jordan famous and he talks about well you got to paint something and do it again and over <laughs> and again and again and again <laughs> Not that I'm necessarily trying to do that. It's just, I think as, I don't know, if all artists are like that, but it's just, it's much easier to rely on what you do and what you know. How do you, um, how do you develop your, your ideas uh, in the inertial kind of concepting stage? Do you, do you sketch a lot? Do you have like a sketchbook that you work in or do you, do you use word lists? Like how do you go about generating ideas for pieces? Uh, I, you, I have like a zillion sketchbooks and I do a ton of doodles. I rarely go. Uh, I rarely take a doodle and like put like some serious effort into it. They're usually just like super quick lightning sketches, but because of technology and the changing of what I do commercially, I've, I was given an iPad and procreate. And now I'm, I haven't touched a sketchbook in a really long time. And I don't know, it kind of makes me sad because there is something really neat about, um, going back to my book and going like, Oh, that's where I was at at the time. And I get to hand that stuff down to my kids and something tactile about the paper. But in the last past, I don't know, two years, it's all been on in procreate in a digital file. Do you, I mean, so, I mean, I, from what I see, the, the, the difference there is, you know, with a, with a sketchbook, you have this sort of history um, and it's not an intentional thing. Like a lot of people will sketch daily just to sketch. And then some of those things may or may not end up becoming a painting. My feeling with Procreate and sketching on a digital is it's very purposeful. It's like I'm trying to create a, this thing and this is the initial generation of it. Or do you use it like a sketchbook where you just start jotting stuff down, save it and then come to the next thing and then maybe look back over and something has promise? Literally no difference. Like mm -hmm. I have some digital pages in Procreate that look exactly like um, my sketchbooks do. Okay. Of just um, like you can spe see my thought process is just like sketch vomit of just random weird stuff until I finally land on something. And then, yeah. At the same time, I also use it to get out of trouble. So if I'm at a point to where I don't know where I'm going with the painting. And I think I want to add uh, an olive branch. Then I will take a photo of it with my phone, bring it into Procreate, render it fully, and then maybe we move it around and block it in different ways. And so I use it as an assistant as well to pre-visualize. So do you do any kind of between the procreate uh, sketches and the painting, do you do any kind of like drawing step in between to finalize your composition before you start painting or do you just jump right into painting? I used to, I used to do um, some pretty fleshed out sketches and studies. However, I've changed in that I'm trying to find ways to be, more of an artist versus a an illustrator so i don't know if that makes sense so i feel if the process feels very mechanical and almost like a, a corporate job in a sense when i plan things out too much but if i have like a just a small doodle and i then say well i'm gonna then put this on to the canvas. I'm not going to use this. It's only just like a conceptual guide and I'm going to start painting and I'm going to allow this painting to go wherever it wants to colors. I have no idea size. I have no idea. Like it's going to be very different from my doodle. And my, at the end, it might not even look like anything like the doodle. 
And so I'm, I find myself trying to lean more towards um, building up my paintings in that way. Has it been hard to, to give up that sort of initial control that you, you were so used to? Hard only in that I'm retraining myself to look at something in a different way. But it, I think it's, for me, it's been more fulfilling. Sure. Yeah. It was, I was at, um, real quick, I was at, uh, so I used to do these events called Baby Tattooville. And these events were put on by Bob Self, Baby Tattoo. And they would have, people would pay like a couple thousands of dollars to go and spend the entire weekend with um, a set group of artists. And how I was invited, I don't know. Because the artists that they had there were just monster artists. And um, again, because I am I think I'm just an overzealous kind of guy, I want to work my ass off and I want to like, I want to make feel people feel as though they're getting their money's worth by having me there. I really didn't sleep. And so I made myself as available as possible to whoever wanted me to draw for them or paint for them or whatever it was. I don't want to spend my time in the hotel room. It was at the Mission Inn in Riverside. I wanted to just be out and about and giving myself to people. And so I remember I was out and this happened. I was there. I, I did it for many years. But I remember two years in particular, Michael Husser was there as well. And um, there was this room called the Koho, Koohan Room. It was this big Buddhist temple room. And we had a collaborative painting up on an easel. And every year, like you would, I would always be there at, you know, from one in the morning till five in the morning, like just painting away. And whoever wanted to come out and sit and watch me paint could watch me paint. And two years in a row, I remember being there like at four in the morning and Mike Husser comes out and it was just me and him having a paint session on the canvas. Oh, that's so cool. And I am the first time it happened, he he instantly went almost like into like teacher mode with me. And he was trying to shake me up and get me to like um, be, get, be more abstract and let go. And he and he was being a bit of a Loki and being mischievous in that he was tr- also trying to convince me to paint over other artists' work. And he was like, nah, I don't really like that. Like, we should change it. He's like, Johnny, you should paint over that. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm not doing it. You should do it. <laughs> but he was taking his paint and he was just like throwing paint at it, painting over other works and then letting it drip and turning it upside down and just being an artist, letting the paint do whatever it wanted. And so that was one of the many moments in my career so far that was it was telling me to just let go and not be so precise and controlling. And it's really, it's liberating, I think. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, So you mentioned it earlier, and I I do want to definitely want to talk about what you have coming up. So, you know, I know you mentioned in your IG feed that you have a new show coming up. I haven't really seen a whole lot announced about it. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about that. Um, I guess, what can you tell about this new show if if you're able to talk? Nothing. (laughs) I'm not showing anything. I'm not talking about at all. No. <laughs> well, it's in November. It's at KP Projects, Mary Kronowski. And I'm not really showing any other work. I'm just, I locked myself in and I'm, yeah, I don't really have much to say. I, I think, I will say that I think that I'm going to call the show um, Atomic Pop. And will there... Are, will there ha- will there be like this greater narr- overall narrative, this arc? Probably not. Each individual piece will, because of the nature of who I am, will have something to say and there will be symbolism in it. But ultimately what I'm trying to do is just, one, I'm just trying to have fun and I'm trying to create something beautiful. I I like decorating homes. I like set dressing and whatnot. And I do think about um, the buyer's place and I do think about their wall colors and I think about how my painting would look on the wall. And I just get excited. Like I, I, I want to go into, I, for this body of work that I have so far, I get excited about like, oh, I, I would die to see where this is going to get hung and lit. And I, 
And the reason why I'm excited because I believe in them so much and I think it's my best show to date. So I'm pretty excited. So November, November's a bit uh, of a ways off. Do you know, have already have an idea of uh, how many pieces you're going to have? I don't know. And November is not a bit of a way off. November is in the world of creating for shows. That is tomorrow. Right around the corner. (laughs) Right around the corner. That is, I've had, I've been working on this by the time the show rolls around, I'll have worked on it for, um, two years. Okay. Yeah. Since your last show, right? Yeah. And I need more time. I, will I have 30 pieces would be nice to have. Um, I'm focused on the big pieces right now. And then once I'll start working on the small pieces, um, those will go by pretty fast. It's a pretty good range in size. For sure. I'm definitely like, I'm, it's a struggle for me in that, you know, my goal is to be an artist, but once you start showing in galleries, you then in a way kind of become an illustrator. It becomes a commercial thing because you have to start thinking about making sure that you have something in there for everybody because not everybody has a budget like that of a music producer to drop some fat cash on a five foot painting. And I want people to walk in there that um, can take something home. And so, yeah, I'm, I have these blocks that I um, have cut from me. Um, So uh, my buddy, Nick, the jiu-jitsu buddy of mine, he owns this shop called, um, it's in Silver Lake, the Blue Rooster. It's an art, it's a art store. So he cuts like little tiny, um, like two and in, three inch by four inch canvases for me on wood. And so he'll cut like hundreds of them for me. And so I just keep like stacks with me. And so I'll probably paint a bunch of those so that again, just so that someone could walk in and feel that they could take something home. Very cool. That's awesome. Um, so I, I guess where can people find you online so they can uh, keep up with the latest? Only Instagram. And for now, you're you're going to get photos of my cat, Miles Battlecat Davis, <laughs> and some pictures of me riding my motorcycle. <laughs> you're not going to get a lot of art, I think. Uh, and if you do get art, you're going to get old stuff that I'm just regurgitating. <laughs> <laughs> up until like a month before the show, where I'll start teasing and sharing more so you, you don't have a website right I, currently no like the fact that i even have an instagram is because of my fiance paris she forced that upon me is that a is that like a conscious decision or uh i don't know i don't know what it is laziness i don't know i uh, if it was up to me i'd still have a flip phone <laughs> and alex one day grab grabbed the flip phone from me and chucked it and said here's an iphone uh, outside of that, I'd still have a flip phone. He forced it upon me. And then X amount of years later, Paris, my fiance, rips my iPhone from me and log downloads Instagram and goes, you are now on Instagram. <laughs> Communicate with people, share with people. <laughs> <laughs> That's fascinating. I mean, it's interesting because you're such a big component of your career is marketing your people, you know, marketing right? the word Isn't out that- about other other people. <laughs> <laughs> You, no one, I don't know. It's so rare. You, I know we see it a lot. There's like, Tristan Eaton designs really well for himself. I have a hard time designing for myself. It's so easy to design for other people. But when it comes to creating for me, uh, that one's, that one's loaded. I don't know how to do that. I'm the hardest client I know. (laughs) (laughs) Very cool. So last question, and this is something that I like to ask everybody. Uh, who is one artist that you'd like to see me have on the show? Um, well, I heard Greg's answer. And I agree with Greg in that the people that I would want are all dead. <laughs> like like the Ivan Durls of the world or the Up Iwerks of the world or the Mary Blairs. And that's simply because I think that in a lot of ways, they are the grandfathers of this scene that you're capturing in your, through your podcast. I think they're the owners of it. And it would be fascinating to have them on here and allow them a chance to say, like, 
you did this. Because if you study a by works and look at like a lot of his early works, so surreal, so surreal. And how many people has Mary Blair influenced? They've changed generations, man. So it'd be amazing to have you get a chance to talk to them about that. I mean, their work, their careers in itself are like mind blowing. However, they are past and that's impossible for you to have them on here. Therefore, I would say someone who I love and I think I should have done research to make sure that you hadn't already, but have you had Ikundayo on here? No, no, I haven't. Ikundayo is someone very dear and close to my heart, along with Mike Maxwell. I think they are both uh, mind-blowing, amazing artists. And not only that, they have a unique perspective on life and they're just very special people. But th- that would be my pick. Very cool. Great suggestion. I appreciate it. And, and Johnny, thank you so much for doing the show, man. This has been a real treat. Well, I have to say, um, like we spoke earlier on, that when you simply just have a mind of coming from a place of curiosity, um, then good things happen. And I just want to thank you on the behalf of a lot of my friends. that We greatly appreciate you for taking oh. up the mantle and sitting down with people and learning and sharing those stories. I think that's beyond special. You're greatly appreciated. I appreciate that. That means a lot. I, I really appreciate it. And, and yeah, that's, that's really the spirit with which I, I come at this. Obviously, you have to have Alex on here. <laughs> yeah, 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 I think that's definitely a, a, a takeaway. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, being being the big Nine Inch Nails nerd that I am, I've 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 talked with him a little bit on Instagram. So, <laughs> okay, because if if for anything, he deserves the chance to retell the story of my snapping his arm, and having <laughs> to put three pins in it. Because you know what? Like at first, it was because so he wasn't mad at me at first, and then years pass, and winters would come around, and the cold would hit his elbow. Mm. And he would go like, damn, like Johnny. Ugh. <laughs> and I always like, I stand by this. The pain that the mental pain that I have felt knowing that I was the one that caused that physical pain. The anguish is incomparable. Like, <laughs> I deal with much more knowing that like I did that to him. So I feel like I'm the one he forced me to break his arm. So I feel like I'm the one that's upset. So you're the victim. You're the victim. Yeah. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Interesting. I think he might have a different take on it, but that's a good way to think of it. (laughs) Awesome. Well, thank you again, man. It's been a a real pleasure having you on. Thank you very much. Cool. We'll we'll cut there. It was good. What did you think? So that's it for this episode of Art Affairs. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Johnny. I really love the way that Johnny described the meaning behind the Command Z moniker. How pure and absolute the undo function is on on computers, resetting things to a state that's, you know, as if the original thing never happened, and recognizing that there's no equivalent in the real world. No matter how much you atone for something bad that you did towards another person, uh, there's no way to really put that back to a state as though it, it never happened. There can be forgiveness and there can be healing, but that will forever be a part of the timeline of your life. And to create a name that serves as a constant reminder of that, you know, encouraging him to always be mindful of his actions and words towards others is pretty awesome, you know, because there, there's no command Z out here in the real world. I'm excited to see how his upcoming show at KP Projects comes together. Tentatively titled Atomic Pop, the focus is less on a particularly heavy, you know, overarching narrative like some of his shows from the past have been, and more about making beautiful work, Um, but work that still has a good amount of importance and meaning within it. It should be opening around the November timeframe, so be sure to follow Johnny's and KP Projects Instagram for more details about the show as they're announced. So thanks again to Johnny for joining me today, and thank you for checking out the show. I'm truly grateful for your support. 
One big way you could help out if you're enjoying the show would be to review it on Apple Podcasts. And of course, just sharing it with your friends. As always, you can contact me through my website at artaffairspodcast.com or on Instagram at artaffairspodcast. So until next time, be good to yourself and be good to each other.